you're being lived by a story that your ancestors wrote. Do I really want to live in that story still? Is, is that a good story? Or do I want to help tell a different story? Cannabis truly is a pharmacy and a flower. Survival comes with cooperation. Pleasure is healing. You're being a warrior of the weird. I'm Lex Pelger, Director of Education at CB Sciences, and this is The Lex Files. I rarely find myself so changed by the research that I do for a podcast. A friend introduced me to the work of Dr. Jeffrey Kripal, and once Dr. Kripal agreed to be on the show, I read three of his books and realized I had read half of one years earlier and had never been able to get it out of my head. Dr. Kripal's work is hard to summarize, though he's officially a professor of comparative religion at Rice University. His early books looked at the connection between the mystic and the erotic in the history of mystic literature. Then he got involved at Esalen, that great hotbed of influential thought and teachings in California, and he started to learn more about anomalous experiences, or what we might call the paranormal or supernormal near-death experiences, out-of-body experiences, precognition, the fascinating literature on children remembering verifiable details from past lives, let alone UFOs and their potential spiritual importance as angels in previous generations. And as you'll hear, one important night in his life helped him to recognize the validity of the stories that people tell, not to dismiss them as anecdotal and therefore not worthy of examination. He writes beautifully on how the findings of quantum physics might relate to all of this and how it might influence our lives. After the interview, I'll give a quick rundown on his books in case you want to start reading his work, which I would recommend. But for now, I'll let him share his knowledge on spirituality, anomalous experiences, and how this might inspire all of us on our own journeys. Hello, everybody. I'm very pleased to be here today with Dr. Jeffrey Kripal. Thanks for joining us. Happy to be here, Lex. My honor. Before we get into more of the body of your work, I wanted to ask about your early days. And when you were a youngster, did you see yourself getting into these kind of fields? Were there clues that this is going to be something you were headed towards? No, the short answer is no. I, you know, <laughs> my, my dreams were all what we might call culture bound. I was going to be an NFL quarterback or short of that, a medical doctor. Those, those were the, the limits of my cultural imagination. You know, no, no kid grows up saying, I'm going to be a professor of, of religion. That, that would be a weird kid, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, I, guess, I guess so. Um, so the other thing that I wanted to ask them, you write about how sometimes a dead author can seem to know your own heart uh, better than you do, that they are there interacting with you. Were there early books in your life that were like that for you, where they just reached out and felt like they were standing next to you? I mean, the truth is, you know, I grew up in rural Nebraska and we didn't read books. <laughs> you know, we, we read comic books or, you know, we watched television. I didn't become a serious reader to, to college, actually, which in this case was a Catholic seminary. And I didn't I didn't really encounter authors that I had that kind of connection with, probably to graduate school. Um, but you did end up in a really fascinating seminary, it sounds like. Could you describe a little bit of how they were doing both spiritual work and emotional work and what that was like for you? I became super pious um, right around puberty, and I also became anorexic, although we didn't have that word. It was This was the late 1970s, disco and... Um, you know, um, kind of late psychedelics. And there was anorexia, particularly in a young male, was just not a category. It wasn't a thing. Nobody knew what it was. And for me, it wasn't anorexia either. It was fasting. I was trying to be holy. I was trying to be a saint. So I was was reading at that point, but I was reading devotional literature. I was reading the lives of the saints. I was reading really kind of scary, conservative Catholic books about purgatory and hell. And you know, essentially trying to save my soul. And um, in the meantime, I was not eating. And um, and so I was suffering, frankly. And there was a lot of, there was a lot of physical suffering. There was a lot of OCD. Um, and so when I got to the seminary at 18 and I entered what they called spiritual direction, 
I also needed a lot of psychotherapy and we got that from something called our chaplain. So we were kind of hit on two levels. There was, we each had a spiritual director and we each had a chaplain and they worked on different levels of the person as it were. And the really tough cases of which I was one, they also sent to their local psychoanalyst who happened to be a monk. And he worked on, on a psychoanalytically with, with kind of classical Freudian techniques. And so I was getting hit from actually three, three dimensions, you know, all at once. And, you know, what was profound about it, Lex, was it didn't separate the intellectual life from the spiritual life, from the emotional life. All of those things were wrapped up in this education I was getting. And the image I knew people had of a Catholic seminary at that point is, you know, it was this prison that you you entered and they locked the gates and until they got a white collar around you, and then they let you go. Um, but actually, the exact opposite was the case. The moment you entered, they tried to convince you to leave, basically. And they, they were trying to figure out, why does this 18-year-old kid think he can be celibate for the rest of his life? What's going on? You know, what, is there some problem here? And, and that was very wise. I mean, that was, these were very wise men, and they were most, almost all men. There were a few nuns involved, but they were mostly men. And so I, I learned from them, and I learned that pursue, I also learned that pursuing intellectual questions was entirely valid spiritually and that god to speak to speak in catholic theological terms god and reason could not conflict it's not possible um and that was incredibly liberating for me as a young man because i had grown up in much more of a kind of protestant slightly evangelical midwestern culture in which God and human reason clearly did conflict. And to realize that there was a whole tradition that was thousands of years old and of which I was a part in some sense that didn't separate those two. In fact, that the modern universities came out of this tradition. Um, that was just kind of amazing, frankly. And it allowed me to ask questions that were pretty radical. In fact, they were so radical that the monks, my spiritual directors, basically told me, I mean, this is the message I got, that, Jeff, you can ask those questions, but you can't do it inside the church. You know, you need, you need to leave. We're not going to let you ask those questions. They're, they're good questions, and, and I understand why you're asking them, and and so there was this kind of there was this kind of profound spiritual support for pursuing really really hard questions but also a recognition of what was possible at that time in in American Catholicism and what what could actually be endured and what could not be endured and I I found that I was sad by the way I mean when I realized I could not become a monk and and enter a monastery because of my honest questions i was i was kind of angry i wasn't angry at anyone by the way but i was mostly sad and 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 i felt exiled i felt rejected um and i found my way to the academic world um not because it's what i wanted or what i grew up thinking about because it was as i joke it was the only institution that would have me. It was, it was the only place where you could actually ask these questions and not only get away with it, but actually be rewarded for asking and trying to answer them. And, and it's, not, it's not a perfect institution. It's not a perfect culture. But it, it's remarkable for its ability to take people in who sort of, sort of back into it. And that, that's how I would describe a lot of intellectual vocations, we we back into them. We don't we don't think about them or pursue them. And so it sounds like that combined some things that you didn't think could be combined before. So 
were some of those questions about the mystic and erotic? Because that was what some of your first books and how you so were, figure out the joining there? Yeah, that's what the tough questions were all about. Not, not in those terms. I didn't have that language. But the, they were very much about looking back now, what I would call male sexual orientation and the spiritual life and how those two things cannot be separated. Um, I felt, I was beginning to feel in the seminary, but particularly in early graduate school, that Catholicism in particular was a tradition that nurtured uh, male homoerotic spiritual orientations. And that celibacy was not about giving up women or giving up heterosexual contact. It was actually about affirming one's own sexual slash spiritual orientation, which was directed towards other men. And again, I came to that not out of anger or any kind of moral judgment. I, I, I felt zero moral judgment, by the way, because uh, I had lived in a what was essentially a gay community, the seminary, and I, these guys were amazing. I thought they were fantastic. Um, but I just wasn't part of that club. I, I didn't belong in the gay bar, you know, that was Roman Catholicism. And, and, and I say that with affection, not, I don't mean to be, um, I don't mean to be casual about it. There, it, it. Their, their sexual orientation is what bound themselves to one another, not in a sexual way, but in a kind of sublimated spiritual way. And it's what gave depth and power and beauty to that iconography, that that liturgy, that theology, it was all homoerotic. It was all about men loving men. If, if you just think about it for two seconds, it's it's not hard to understand that. And so I I looked for something within the Catholic tradition that was for straight men who loved women and would need some kind of feminine or female notion of divinity, and I couldn't find it. It, it actually doesn't exist, Lex. And you can find little pockets of it, but it's always heretical, you know? So you can find, you can find Jakob Boehme in the Lutheran tradition, or you can find William Blake in the British tradition, or Teilhard de Chardin in the Roman Catholic tradition. They're all heretics. They're all rejected by their traditions. Uh, and I came to the conclusion that they were rejected because their systems were heterosexual. And it actually doesn't fit in to the tradition. The, the, the marginalization is correct. Um, and so that was all my early work, Lex. I, I, I thought about nothing but sexuality and mystical experience and, and union with God for 20 years. And, and that's all I wrote about. Um, and then later I got into other things, but yeah, I mean, those were my questions and those questions, Lex, let me, let me back up. Those were not generated out of curiosity. Those were generated to save my life because I was, a, I was an ascetic who was not eating precisely to keep my sexuality down and out. And when I realized that, that's when the healing began. And that's when I got my body back. But when my body came back online, so did my sexuality. And it didn't fit in. It just didn't fit in. And it couldn't fit in. And it wasn't anybody's individual fault. It wasn't the monk's fault. It wasn't my fault. It was history's history. It was a function of history and tradition and and I understood that on a very embodied um, level. And so it wasn't that I left because I was had, it wasn't because I, I didn't leave because I was scandalized or I was somehow abused or mistreated. Quite the contrary, they were wonderful to me. I left because I had to leave. I, I did not fit in. And, and that's kind of been a, a, a source of sadness for me ever since. I don't say that with, with any kind of accomplishment or pride. I say that as in sorrow, you know. It does sound hard to not have 
that fit somewhere that it would be uh, right for you. And so how did your, how did on a practical level for someone who's listening, thinking about the mystic and the erotic, how did you start to come to this in your personal life of joining these two forces? Well, so by the mystical life, I mean some kind of profound and direct encounter with deity or divinity or ultimate reality, however you imagine that in, in your own culture or your own language. And of course, that does not depend on a religious tradition. And because reality is reality, God is God, if you want to speak theistically. No, nobody owns God. And despite what the traditions say, nobody gets to speak for God. And nobody gets to speak for ultimate reality. And what I learned is that not just a few people, but probably the majority of people don't really identify with their cultural or religious traditions anymore. And they continue to have these experiences outside of tradition and outside of history. And they're, they're, they're very, they're very conflicted about them because they don't fit into any particular culture or any established tradition. And I became not only fascinated by that, but also moved by it. I was spiritually moved by people having religious experiences that were not religious in any traditional way. And, and that became the new big question I had, or the new project I had was to think about that historically, but also to help, help, help communities and help individuals. Not, and not, not, not that I had answers. I don't have answers to this, but that, you know, I shared in their seeking or their quest as it were. And, that seemed to help, you know, because it created these little, these little pockets or these little communities. And it's some of the most poetic parts of your writing is this American idea going back to Emerson of a religion of no religion, that the idea of spiritual, but not religious isn't out of the counterculture of the sixties. It goes back to the very beginning. And I was wondering if you could share more on how you came to that. Well, you know, in the, so in the 80s and early 90s, I had the same kind of, frankly, arrogant attitude towards what we might think of as the new age that most other academics had, that it was some kind of cafeteria-style spirituality and that these people were not serious and that they lacked a theodicy and they lacked a morality and they were just kind of spoiled white people who had too much time on their hands and, you know, we're just kind of taking things from wherever and putting them together. What happened was a lot of things happened. First of all, my first book, Collie's Child, was controversial, to put it mildly, and I became a target of people's religious hatred. And that went on for six years. And in the midst of that, Michael Murphy, who helped co-found the Eslin Institute in Big Sur, California, called me. He was sort of blown away by the same book on a, on a kind of spiritual level. And he invited me out there. And I started to go out to Eslin. And I realized that these people weren't at all like I thought they were. They were really thoughtful and they were educated. And I realized that they're, they had a, a logic. There was a reason that they were putting pieces together from different religions and cultures. And it's what I now call a transcendent logic. You know, once you locate the human spirit above any and all local cultures, then of course it will pick and choose and combine and compare and collage to its heart extent. There's, it's, it's sovereign, to use Nietzschean terms. It's a sovereign self. It, it, it doesn't it isn't, a, it isn't reliant on any local culture. And all this language of appropriation and all this condemnation and all this moralizing, it's all a function of reducing the human person to a single social position and to a nation state or, or a religion or a culture. And it's essentialist, essentially. And I realized that, that being spiritual but not religious had its own intellectual integrity and that it actually was convincing. I was actually convinced by it. And that it had deep American roots going back at least as to Emerson, but it also had older roots than that going back 
centuries or millennia. You can find it in ancient Egypt, by the way, in, her, in kind of early Hermeticism. And there you have Egyptian people doing the exact same thing that the Californians were doing in the 1960s and 70s because they realized the same thing, that the human spirit wasn't a cultural thing. Uh, it, it was transcultural. It was, it was something else. And, and I saw the same thing in India when I lived in India. The Hindus were doing the same thing as well. They were just putting bits and pieces together from everywhere that became Hinduism. Every, everyone was doing it. it there, there's, there's no such thing as appropriation. Or if you want, there's only appropriation. That's all there's ever been. You know, we, we borrow and collage like crazy. That's what human beings have always done, and it's what they'll always do. And so I began to find the, the academic condemnation of this entirely unpersuasive and really quite cruel, frankly, to the people I came to know and, 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 really, and really love on some level. And, and that's kind of how I got into the human potential movement and the spiritual but not religious was, again, it wasn't an abstract curiosity. It started out as an attempt to survive because I was being chased essentially by really hateful Hindu fundamentalists. And I, they chased me into the arms of these spiritual but not religious people who you know, came from all kinds of cultures. Um, so that's, that's how that happened. And that's, that's essentially where I am to this day. I, I really think that this is an old, old American tradition, and it's also a European and a pan-Asian tradition as well. And, and I really locate myself in that kind of global history. I don't, I don't identify with a particular local religion or culture. And from your work, it it makes sense too, because you often talk about people who have had anomalous experiences that cause them to flip uh, the title of your new book, which we'll link right. to in the episode notes. And I was wondering if you could talk about the anomalous experience in your life, what led up to that and to what you call the night. Right. So, yeah, let, let, let me push forward and then move back to the night. The night's in 1988, but let, let me start somewhere around... 05 or 06, somewhere in there. I, I'm finishing up this big history of the California counterculture and the human potential movement. And, you know, I'm talking and hanging out and living and drinking and eating with all of these weird people from California. And they're telling me all these crazy stories. And, I'm, and I, I realized at some point, well those stories really happened. I actually trust these people. And I was trained in a discipline that claimed that those kinds of stories were always legends or always made up for political ends. And I realized that they weren't. I realized that that's not true, actually. That people from all walks of life, all education, all cultures, all races, all religions have these anomalous experiences. And that was kind of shocking to me, Lex. I Again, I was unprepared for that. My training did not – I had studied religion and mysticism actually for 35 years at that point, or 25 years, and we, I hadn't read a single book on anomalous experiences or what we might call the miraculous or much less the paranormal. It had just been erased. It had just been taken off the table, as I say, or as my friend Walter Honegraaff says. Um, and I became fascinated by those anomalous experiences, not because I just naively believe everything that's told me, but because I realized that those experiences were trying to get our attention and that they violated the way we think the world's put together and what we think a human being is. And so just as an intellectual, I'm always, I always have my ears open for violations of the norm or anomalies because those are always signals that something new is happening, that some new story is trying to birth itself. And I also became convinced that approaching those anomalous events scientifically, which a lot of my colleagues were doing, was the wrong way to go. That these things weren't about mechanisms 
or proof or science. They were about story and narrative and meaning. And that they, they were the beginnings of what eventually will become religion, you know, or not, you know, but that it's really these kinds of anomalous experiences that lie behind a lot of religious beliefs. I came to that conclusion not because I was some kind of gifted psychic. I'm not. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of a dullard, as I like to say. But I had had one such experience. And it's what I call the, that night. Uh, it happened in the f- no- early November of 1989. I was living in Calcutta, which was Calcutta then, not Kolkata. It's now Kolkata. Um, and I was participating in something called Kali Puja, which is the ritual worship of, of the goddess Kali. And I was writing my dissertation on this great devotee of the Kali named Ramakrishna. So I was really involved in that particular culture. And one night or one early morning, uh, I woke up, uh, but my body didn't. And I felt this uh, incredible energy come out of me or come out of the room or the wall or wherever it came from. And it started to do things to me. It started to do really sexual things to me. It all started to do really physical things. I My first thought is I was being electrocuted. So it wasn't subtle. It wasn't some kind of simple dream. It was like sticking your finger in a wall socket. and But it was very pleasurable. And it was very, very scary. I, I really thought I was dying. And I just laid, I couldn't move. And I just laid there as this thing did its thing. And at some point, it kind of imploded and flowed into my heart. And, and when it did that, I left my body and, and floated to the ceiling. Um, and I don't know what happened then. I mean, I, my, my guess is something happened then that I can't remember. And and eventually I got back into my body and I woke up and I was like, holy smokes, you know, that that was that was pretty amazing. Um and and so that 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 one experience, so it, it didn't like turn me into some kind of guru or some kind of enlightened being, but it was enough. That when le- much later people would tell me about their near death experiences or their out of body experiences, or frankly their alien abduction experiences, I would like, yeah, I know what that's like. <laughs> I I get it, you know. It, it gave me this kind of intuitive, yep, yep, I know, and it made me really sympathetic to the stories I was hearing. Um, so I think that was kind of its purpose, actually. I think that's what it was aimed toward, was the, fu- the future sympathy. But to this day, I don't know exactly what it was. If you were to get enough beer in me um, and really ask me what I thought, what I honestly think about it today, uh, which I learned from Philip K. Dick, by the way, I think all of my future books flowed into me at that moment and that I had no context for them, none. And so I didn't, I had no way of understanding what was happening, but that every single book I've written since then has been an attempt to kind of get back to that night because I think they were all there at that night. I think all of the books were there. And so there's kind of this weird loop effect where you know, the books from the future are flowing back into that present, and then I work towards that future. And so creativity is being in this this loop, you know, a series of loops. Um, and I know that sounds crazy, but I actually believe that. It's actually how I think about writing. It's actually how I write. I, I don't think I'm – I think I'm actually working towards something that already exists in the future. Um, and so that's what I think about it now. That is not what I thought about it for you know the first 25 years or so that's that's in the last four or five years and i could be wrong lex but in some ways it doesn't matter if i'm wrong if that's what i think then that's that's what i think you know and it rings true with so much that you read and hear from artists i spend a lot of time reading about writers and artists and where they you know they feel like it's an uncovering of what's already there the little boy asks how how did you know there was a horse inside that block of marble it's like well of course it was there and it feels like an uncovering. It's, it's felt like what it has with my books as well. Um, 
And so it actually, it, it speaks to something that I wanted to ask you about uh, that seems related. You said how much of this anomalous um, events are related to emotions and purpose and spirituality. Um, so I was wondering if you could talk about the origin of the word telepathy and where where those words come from and how that actually relates to emotion. Yeah, so, I mean, that was one of my projects early on. You know, after I realized that these people in California were telling me the truth, and I became kind of shocked on how little scholars of religion talk about these things, I, I started to write a history or an intellectual history of the paranormal, and that became Authors of the Impossible. And I realized that virtually every one of these words were, was coined by academics or scientists, and that all of these terms have elite university or scientific origins, and it's only in the 20th century they, they become tabloid-like and they become shamed, as it were. Um, and telepathy is a perfect example. So telepathy was, was coined in 1882 by a British classicist named Frederick Myers, and he coined it because he had read hundreds, if not thousands, of these stories in which a loved one knows instantly that another loved one has died or is in danger or is, or, or is dead. And he realized that what linked these human beings was some kind of emotion, some kind of love. He actually called it eros. He believed it was erotic in the platonic sense, not the sexual sense. But he also called it pathos, you know, which was the other Greek term. And tele is Greek for at a distance. So the telephone just means a voice at a distance. Or the telegraph for, at the time, which was the cutting edge technology, was just writing at a distance, you know. So when he coined telepathy in 1882, he was actually thinking of the telegraph, but he was also thinking of suffering pathos at a distance. And that has always struck me as true. And it's why, you know, when the debunkers say, well, why can't you win the lottery with this? I'm like, that's a stupid question. You know, there's no, there's no pathos. Nobody's dying. You know, your house isn't burning down, guy. Of course, you're not going to see the numbers. Why would you see the numbers? You know, so, so to me, once you understand that emotional or empathic or even loving or erotic component, then you really are starting to understand why people become telepathic at certain points. And, and by the way, that's been confirmed. I mean, some of the latest stuff on precognition, for example, is linked directly to sexual arousal. We know that. We know that people who are sexually aroused tend to be more precognitive than people who are not. And that's just, man, that's Frederick Myers in 2015 or whatever, you know, whenever Daryl Bem did his, his experiments. I mean, that, that doesn't surprise me at all. All of us mammals share an endocannabinoid system. That's why you hear so many stories of people using CBD-rich hemp extracts for their pets. It works for dogs, it works for cats, it works for all of us. For the Plus CBD line of pet products, we only made a few tweaks between what we give to us humans and what we give to our animal friends. It's still full-spectrum hemp extract with all of the rich fatty acids, terpenes, and minor cannabinoids that help the CBD to work better. It's still made with the highest quality to produce the most reliable hemp extracts on earth. The only difference is that we adjusted the flavor palette to make it easier to give to your dog or to your cat. With flavors like chicken, beef, peanut butter, and salmon, it's easy to drop it into their food and allow them to enjoy the healthful benefits of CBD. Try Plus CBD's pet products today by using the coupon code LEXFILES at pluscbd.com for 25% off. Give your pets the gift of health. That's LEXFILES at pluscbd.com. 
you've uh, gotten me into engaging more in the anonymous literature, as you as you call it. And one of the best stories, uh, there's so many stories that it's just overwhelming to a scientist uh, yeah. that if you just don't think that everybody's lying all the time. I was wondering if you could share the story of Mark Twain's, because that one I found particularly convincing and helpful. Yeah, so that's it's that. a class it's a classic story in the literature actually and well documented by the way um, both by his family members and also by himself in his diaries. It's also a, a wonderful story because you know Twain so Twain I'm sure most people have read some Mark Twain or Samuel Clemens is was his real name. You know he comes across as kind of this um, you know, he's there to take down people's assumptions, and he's sort of the the provocateur, and he's also very funny. Um, but he was also completely convinced in telepathic phenomena, and was actually, you know, corresponded to William James at Harvard about it, and was involved in the early American Psychical Research Society. And what was so interesting about Twain was he linked this stuff to his own literary creativity. He believed he got ideas for his novels through essentially telepathy. And he had reason to believe that because it happened over and over again. And when he was older, he wrote these two essays, both called Mental Telegraphy, not Mental Telepathy, Mental Telegraphy, but he meant the same thing. And they appeared in Harper's Weekly, which was this national magazine. And he wanted to publish them anonymously, by the way. Um, which I always think is hilarious. I mean, if you're a magazine editor and the most famous author in the whole country comes to you and says, I want to publish an essay, but oh, by the way, I don't want to use my name. What, what are you going to say as an editor? You're going to say, uh, no, we're not going to do that. So eventually Twain published both of these pieces, you know, in – Harper's, and he tells the story, the, which is the most moving one, really. He and his brother worked on these steamships, steamboats, in on the big rivers, Mississippi and the, probably the Missouri. And one day he fell asleep, and he had this dream of of Henry, Henry was his brother's name, that Henry had died, and that Samuel was going to the funeral. And Henry was laid out in a metal coffin, which was unusual for the time, by the way, sitting on two chairs. And there was a, a, a bouquet of white roses with a single red rose in the center. And, and Henry was wearing Samuel's clothes. Okay, so that was the dream. And it wasn't a dream. It was just like so vivid and so odd. It was so vivid when he got up, he actually got dressed and was going to go to the the, the the funeral home, essentially, of the time. And then he realized that, you know, it was just a dream. But I don't know if it was three, two or three weeks later, what happened was Samuel and Henry got separated because of a fight, actually, with the, the captain of the ship, and the steamship blew up. It was actually one of the worst steamship disasters in American history at that point, and it killed lots and lots of people, it it mortally burned and wounded Henry. It technically didn't kill him. But what happened was, is the young doctor who was tending to him gave him too much um, opiate or opium or whatever they were giving him, and it killed him, he died, died from his burns and died from the narcotic. And so he did die two or three weeks later. And Samuel goes to the funeral, and there's the metal casket. There's Henry in his in Sam's suit. It's sitting on two chairs. The only thing that's missing is this this bouquet, you know. And as he's sitting there, just kind of stunned by the scene, this woman walks in with this bouquet and lays it on Henry's chest, and you know fulfills the dream in perfect detail. So, you know, when you have that kind of thing, you you can. You can reason and talk about statistics and probably you, you can do whatever you want, and none of it means a thing. Your your brother's dead, and you saw him three weeks later in the exact same 
situation that he's in now. And, and that really, you know, that really changed Twain, I think. And, and, and then he writes about a lot of instances that are related to that. But that's just one, as you say, that's one of tens of thousands of these stories. And after you read a couple hundred of them, I, I don't even know why there are skeptics. I, I really don't. Uh, unless they're just not reading, which I suppose is possible. But I don't know how you read enough of these stories and then say it's coincidence. That's just so, well, it's cruel for one thing, but it's just not, it's not persuasive after a while. Um, and so, you know, that's sort of what I ended up doing was focusing not on one unbelievable story after another, but why are they about emotion and why are they about loss and why are they about love? And, you know, focusing on that as, as a humanist, really. I'm not a scientist. I actually don't want to be a scientist. I think science is kind of boring and really slow. Too slow for me. I'll be dead before the science catches up to anything I'll be interested in. Um, but you can get right to the meaning of things quickly as a reader or as, a, as, as, as another human being. You've written about the power of the, the humanistic tradition to be the, the counterpoint to science. So this is where science is trying to go, you might say. And I was wondering if you could share more about what you dream of for the humanities to bring back yeah. themselves to importance. Yeah. So, you know, when I make fun of science, I, of course, I really am an admirer of science and I, 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 I love science and I write endlessly about it because I'm fascinated by it. But I think we need, we also need to tease it and we need to tease scientists and we need to get out of our fetishization of the scientific method and of science. Um, and what I, and why I say that is what science does is it splits the world into two, into this human subject that is studying dead objects out there and manipulating them and measuring them and predicting them and turning them into stuff, into technology we can then use, all of which works, all of which is great. But it's also illusory at the end of the day because the self doing all of that stuff is the same stuff as that stuff. There's really no difference. The splitting is artificial. And... And so that's really what I'm trying to say. And I also, you know, where the really interesting science goes today is that they're becoming more and more aware of the observer effect and the way that the human scientist is affecting the science that he or she is doing. And so for me, those are humanistic questions. Um, I often joke that the sciences are really just subdivisions of the humanities. And what I what I mean by that, which is which is totally shocking, by the way, if you work in a university, but what I mean by that, I, I always ask people, I'm like, you know, have you ever met a scientist that wasn't a human being? Because I haven't. And so clearly, science is a product of human activity. It, it's it's somehow human. And and they look at me like, you know, I have three heads because they, they want to imagine that science is somehow, I guess, not human, is somehow, you know, objective. But it clearly isn't. It's clearly a function of human beings. And all of our science, all of it is, you know, as my colleague Don Hoffman likes to say, it's, it's a function of the virtual reality gear we have on. It's a function of our senses and of our brains. It's not what reality really is. It's how we perceive reality through these cognitive and sensory capacities that have evolved so that we can survive, not so we can see how things really are. And so I just, you know, as someone who's steeped in mystical literature, I just don't believe that that's how things really are. I think that's how things really are if you have the goggles on. But I don't think that's how things really are. And you talk and write quite beautifully about the quantum effects and how these might scale up to this world. One of my um, 
favorite lines is I'm a walking wave function. And so I was wondering, why is it your <laughs> hope that we're every bit as bizarre as the quantum worlds? Yeah. So this, yeah, this is one of my complaints. So first of all, don't ask me to explain quantum mechanics. I, I, I can't and I don't. But what I will insist on is that the comparisons between quantum physics and mystical literature was not invented in 1975. It wasn't invented by hippie physicists. It was the product of the early pioneers of quantum mechanics who saw instantly that the philosophical implications of quantum mechanics were very similar to what was going on in the mystical literature. So they were the ones who pointed it out. Uh, Schrodinger and Pauli and Bohr and people like that. Bohr, in fact, had the Taoist yin and yang on his coat of arms. I mean, come on. He's already pointing and saying, look, this is what the implications are. And so, you know, as someone who studies those traditions, I'm not speaking for the quantum physicists, I'm speaking about those traditions and how they are really in parallel or resonating with one another. And the line you're referring to, what really bothers me as someone working in the humanities is that a physicist can come out in the news and say any goddamn thing he wants about anything. And it can be batshit crazy. You know, it can be about 11 dimensional strings vibrating in infinite space that we will never see. Okay. It can be about ghost universes or God particles or retro causation. I mean, they can just talk anything. But when a humanist steps up and says, well, hey, Mark Twain really experienced the future. Sorry. You know, three weeks out, you're called, you're called all kinds of names. I'm like, what the, what the fuck is the difference? The physicist is over here talking about retro causation and entangled particles on different sides of the cosmos. And I'm just talking about an American author seeing his dead brother. And, and you won't even let me have that. So I, I just think that's like just wrong. I just think that's fundamentally wrong. It's, it's hypocritical. And I just want to point that out to people. Um, because I, I love the physicists when they talk like that. I think that that's great. But I also think people in the humanities should be talking like that. And that that's great, too. Um, yeah, it reminds me of the line from J.B.S. Haldane that the universe is uh, stranger than we imagine and perhaps stranger than we can imagine. Yeah. And it's one of the things I really loved about your work so far is – about how these paranormal anomalous experiences that have happened so much in this last century and have probably been happening all through human history would be the basis of religions if something yeah. happened like that to you. And so could you explain a little bit on your quote, the study of the paranormal is the quantum physics of the study of religion? Yeah. Yeah. So what I mean by that, so if you, if you talk to physicists, what happens on a subatomic or quantum level is not what happens on this level that you and I are looking at and interacting with. That there, that quantum effects actually do not scale up easily. They get washed out. But they're still real. And everything that exists, exists because of that quantum level. We're sort of sitting on top of it. And the, the sort of Newtonian physics of, of, of these dimen this dimensional world is really a product of this, this really weird subatomic foam or ocean going on below us, as it were. Um, and I think paranormal phenomena are like that in religion. So I often say that paranormal phenomena are proto-religion. They're not religion. You know, so when you think about religion, what you're really talking about is institutions and buildings and communities and politics and societies and art and doctrines and scriptures, these are all really coded, stable material objects and traditions that might be nuanced and complicated, but they're still rooted in some pretty stable things. But they began 
as memories of anomalous or paranormal phenomena. You know, Christianity, if you really, if you read the Gospels, honestly, Jesus is basically a paranormal prodigy. You know, he's basically a magician or a shaman. And the greatest anomalous phenomena of, Christ, of Christian history is the resurrection, of course. And not everybody sees it. Different people perceive it in different ways. They remember it in different ways, exactly like paranormal phenomena today. So, but those then get codified and turned into doctrine and creed, and they eventually become religion. But you wouldn't have the religion without the paranormal phenomena. There would be no Jesus without the healings and the cursings and the omniscience and the clairvoyance and, and the walking on the water and the raising from the dead. No no, no paranormal, no Jesus, period. And But that doesn't mean that the paranormal phenomena support or lead to religion because sometimes they don't. Sometimes they conflict with religion and religions are scared of them because they're essentially destabilizing, you know? I mean, I've given lectures on paranormal phenomena to really profoundly religious groups. And a lot of the religious people will say to me things like, well, isn't this anti-religious? And what they mean by that is, if this is true, then clearly my beliefs aren't exclusively true. And I have to say, yes, I think you're right. I, I think that's what these experiences do imply that your own beliefs are relative to your own culture and your own time. It doesn't mean your beliefs are wrong. They're, they're based on some kind of anomalous experience or event. But to the extent that you exclude other anomalous events and you say it only happens here, yeah, you're, you're wrong. Sorry. That's just not true. You know, so I think we have to be honest about that. And we have to understand that these things are not necessarily religiously friendly. Um, and that's, by the way, why they're often demonized as well, too, I think. I mean, they're literally demonized. This is literally about demons. And if you inhabit a religious world that you're trying to preserve, huh, there's a lot of demons running around, let me tell you. So to, to get practical about how this might come into our own lives, maybe I'd ask about the term neurotheologian that uh, Aldous Huxley came up with in the island. If you could have a, an institute there at your university training neurotheologians, or you could help put neuro, neuro, neurotheologians in the world, you know, what, what did they do and how would they help us as a society? So Huxley um, did coin this term neurotheology. And what he meant by, it's really important to understand what he meant. So Huxley's, Huxley knew a lot about the mystical traditions of the world. He had written about them in the mid-40s. He's most known today. This is a perfect example of what I'm always complaining about. The thing people know about Huxley is Brave New World, which is his dystopian novel. It's where all the shit happens. It's, it's where things go wrong. But he also wrote a utopian novel right before he died that answered Brave New World called Island. And guess what? Nobody reads it. You know? We all, we all think the dystopian world is what Aldous Huxley was about when he himself said, that's not what I think. That's what I thought. It's not what I think now. What I really think is all in Ireland. And if you read Ireland, what, what it's really about is this, this fictional island named Paula where at puberty all adolescents are given what are essentially magic mushrooms and they're initiated into this cosmic form of mind. And then that then becomes the basis of their culture is realizing that the brain is not the producer of consciousness. It's, it's a biological filter or translator or reducer of consciousness. And that's what Huxley really thought. He really thought it was a mistake to see the brain as producing mind, that it's really about reducing mind and turning it into a person. And so when he talked about neurotheology, what he meant was, how can we study this relationship between brain function 
and this larger conscious mind or cosmic mind that people call God. That's the, that's the theology part of it. Um, and of course, there are a few people doing neurotheology today. They even use the word, but there's no real money behind it. And there's no, and, and by money, I don't mean that crudely. If you really are serious about asking a question, guess what? You need to invest in it. You need money. And you don't just need a few dollars. You need hundreds of millions of dollars over many generations. And as a culture, we just don't care. We don't even believe in the the God part or the cosmic mind part. All we believe in is the brain part. And so we spend all this money studying the brain, but we don't we don't spend any money studying the cosmic mind coming through the brain because we don't even believe there is such a thing. And, I, and of course, I'm speaking for other people now. I'm not speaking for me. <laughs> I think they're wrong. Um, and I think that's what we'd find out if we actually did this. But to this day, we're not doing that, Lex. Of course, you know as well as I do that the way Huxley came to this conclusion was through psychedelics, was through mescaline. And so there is some... There's some hope today. I mean, there is a lot of real research on psychedelics in hospitals and research institutes, but they tend to, to approach that pharmaceutically or scientifically and not, not historically or philosophically like I'm suggesting. And, and it's not one or the other. I'm not suggesting they stop doing that. I'm just saying I think we should be doing – we need to look at both sides of the picture here, the neuro part and the, the, the theology part and not just – one alone. And that was another practical question that actually would come out of Huxley because the other part of his life that was nice at the end was that he had a, a pretty young wife and he was enlivened again. And as you have wrestled with these issues, how does it bleed down to your practical everyday life. I always say, don't put someone on a pedestal until you read the book that their spouse wrote about them. And luckily, <laughs> Huxley's second wife wrote a beautiful book about him. You can really keep him up on that pedestal, I think. Um, so for you, all of this different work, you know, how, how, does, how does it feel like it comes down to make you a better partner and a better teacher? So first of all, let me say something about Maria. Maria was his second wife. His first wife died of cancer, you know, quite tragically. And then he remarried and remarried Maria. And Maria taught at Esalen, by the way. Uh, she was a real friend and, and teacher there. And I got to talk to Maria before she passed about Aldous and about Island. And she told me in no uncertain terms that if you really wanted to know what how Aldous thought, just read Island. That's where he put everything. And I asked people who knew Aldous and who knew Maria, I was like, I was like, have you, have you read the early Aldous Huxley and then have you read Island? I'm like, what the hell happened? You know, man, that is a transformation. And, and they would just smile and laugh and they'd say, did, did you see photos of Maria? <laughs> you know, you know, in, you know, in the, in the, in the 1950s, you know, so I was like, okay, I, I get it. You know, if you put, if you put Maria together with masculine and LSD, you start to get the, get the picture of what really flipped Aldous Huxley, you know. Um, so that's that's Huxley. Um, how do I do it? You know, again, I don't see myself as gifted in these realms, and but I do think that there is a real vocation or a calling for people in the sciences and in the humanities and social sciences to act as anchors and to kind of carve out a space in the forest so that other people can come in and sit around the fire and tell their stories. And I see my role as a cultural elite, and I, and I say that with humility, not, not as a bragging statement, as someone in the academy trying to carve out a space in the academy for younger people then to come in and, and occupy that space and push the, push the conversation forward. Um, you know, I'll tell you something, Lex, that I've never told anybody, actually, uh, certainly on a podcast, but I think it's relevant here to your question. So when I was in the seminary, go back to the seminary now with my spiritual directors, one of my spiritual directors said to me then, that so I was just a kid, I was 18, 19 years old, and he said to me something I've never forgotten. He said, someday 
you will guide souls. And I think he was thinking I was going to be a monk or a priest and do that in a Catholic way. And of course, that didn't happen. I think I've hopelessly disappointed him in that way. But I think that's really what we're still called to do on some level, to guide souls. And and by that, I don't mean that I somehow have the answer or the destination, but that as a teacher and as an intellectual and a writer, it really is my duty or my calling to guide or help initiate conversations about where it is we're going and what we're doing as a culture and what's next, not what's, not what's in the rearview mirror, mirror. I mean, we can talk about that. I, I love that too, but it's also much more important where we're headed. And, and so that's kind of what keeps me, that's what gets me up in the morning is is that groundedness um i don't live in the heights i i'm not a superman or a superhuman i'm an ordinary human being but i think that grounding gives me the freedom and the security to you know fly in these realms in my in my mind and in the books and it's it's funny you mentioned both teaching and superpowers, because those are two of the last things I wanted to ask you about. Um, and so I'll start with the teaching, because one of the interesting things you mentioned is when you first started teaching the introduction to religions, how challenging that could be, especially in the university setting you were. And you kind of came up with an initiation ritual about how to yeah. guide young people into wrestling with that. And I was wondering if you could share more about that with us who might be wrestling with faith ourselves. Yeah, so... So I've been teaching the intro course to world religions or comparative religion for almost 20 years now. And when I started doing it, I started it at a liberal arts college in Pennsylvania called Westminster College. And I had a close colleague there, still a close colleague named Brian Rennie. And we both taught the course. And I kind of experimented. There's two ways to teach it. You can either do the world religions model. So you, you start with indigenous religions and then, you know, you go to ancient Hinduism and then Buddhism and maybe some Jainism and Judaism, Christianity, Islam, Sikhism, you know, whatever. Maybe you end up with secularism or something. Or you could do the thematic approach and kind of pick ritual and magic and uh, mythology and life after death. And you can pick themes and so I did it in different ways at Westminster, but what <laughs> I'm laughing, I shouldn't laugh. What what I realized I was actually doing was I was taking apart, deconstructing these kids' worldviews, and then I would send them home for Christmas. And there was no there was no resolution. It was just, I'm gonna take everything apart and see you later. Good luck. And at some point I was like, wow, that doesn't feel right. That's not, I don't think we should be doing that. So I talked to Brian about it. and He suggested Victor Turner, of all people, who is this anthropologist who, who wrote a lot about initiation cycles. And for Turner, there were just three stages of every initiation. There was the pre-initiation stage where, you know, you were the, say you're a boy. Say it's, say it's an, a, a puberty or initiation ritual. So before the ritual, you're just, you're just Lex. You're 10 years old and you're a kid. Then you enter this initiation cycle and you enter what Turner called the liminal stage. And so the men take you out to the forest and leave you there, throw you in a cave or a ditch or something, or take you up on the mountain and abandon you. And and things happen. You know, things come apart and you enter this kind of dis- dissolution stage. But then there's always this post-initiation stage in which the elders or the culture puts you back together as now a man. You're now a man. You can no longer live with the women. you got to live with the men. And your identity and role and agency in that culture is fundamentally changed. And so I realized, hey, we could do that with this, this comparative religion course. We could start out with the worldview of the kids, as I call them now because I'm older, wherever they're at, we can then engage in all this deconstruction and challenging and questioning and just throw things into chaos for them. But we've got to get this third stage of the course where they can put the pieces back together, and we have to give them some options to do that. 
And so that's what I do now. And it really works. Um, and it works because the students, and these are young people, of course. You know, these 18 and 19-year-olds, they already are questioning their worldview. They've already taken things apart. So they're ready to have them taken apart. And they're also really appreciative when you say, okay, well, you can put them together this way or that way or this way. I'm not going to tell you how to do it. You choose. You put your own world back together. And, and there are religious ways to do that. There are secular ways to do that. There are spiritual but not religious ways to do that. And so I give them about seven or eight options. And I said, go for it. And they do it. And they are very appreciative because I tell them from day one, this is what we're going to do. If you don't want to do this, get out of here. Don't do this. This your It's your responsibility. It's your choice. And this is how the course is going to go. And that's how it goes. And so when I, rare, when I do get the rare student who comes up to me in October, say, or March or whatever, the middle of semester, and he's, he or she's freaking out, I'm like, what did I tell you? You know, what did I say was going to happen? And you stayed in here. And they're like, yeah, <laughs> they're like, yeah, yeah, I know. I remember, you know, so they, they start to own it, you know, and they, they're like, yeah. So that's how I do it now. And I find it really works. And, um, and it's powerful. It's really powerful to sit, sit on that level with these young people and, watch them have their own questions and come to their own answers and, and take apart each other's worldview, by the way, because they're sitting in a classroom with a hundred other kids, all of whom are coming from different cultures. So it's really hard to pretend yours is the one. That would, uh, that would be fun to go through that course uh, or not fun. I mean, it sounds, it sounds like a, a heck of a good uh, challenge, but it's, yeah, uh, it, I wouldn't look forward fun. to it actually it like many fun. initiation rituals. Yeah. Yeah, just like five grams of mushrooms. It's like, yeah, I'll do it, but I got to sneak up to it a little bit, back into it. Yeah, um, yeah well, I don't have any and, mushrooms um, to give them, so that, that's the difference. Yeah, they'll, they'll find them. <laughs> um, the And speaking of that, I we there was a great uh, martial artist, Clint E., who recently passed, and he would talk about the psychedelic experience at the base of many of the great martial arts that some of the kind of superpowers that were theorized around the formings of these were from psychedelics and you've collected so many of these stories of people ex of doing things that seem beyond you know it's super normal is a great word for it that you used and the buddhists would call it cities and i would ask what would you recommend to people who are interested in you know, the human potential of themselves, of gaining some superpowers uh, in whatever direction they feel like they're here to evolve towards. What tools have you found to recommend to people? Well, I think community is the most important thing, you know, to find find people who share your your worldview and your your goals. I, you know, I study mostly people who come to these abilities accidentally or traumatically or spontaneously i i'm always a bit suspicious of people seeking them out on their own um that's a very traditional religious perspective by the way which i'm quite critical of but i think these abilities um, are much more common and often much more dramatic when they happen spontaneously uh, like in a lightning strike or a near-death experience or or in a psychedelic experience, for example. Um, and I've never really, I mean, I have actually interacted with people in, who have stabilized these abilities and who could pretty much do it on call. So it's not true that it never happens, but it's extremely rare. And for most of us, we we become Superman only in moments of crisis or or danger and we're Clark Kent for the rest of our existence and so my my main advice is to be both but to really learn to go to the daily planet and be ready for superman when he shows up but don't as i as i tell my students superman never gets a job ever 
No, nobody will hire Superman. <laughs> you know, they'll hire Clark Kent, but they won't hire Superman. So again, it's about this grounding and this ability to sort of be both or to imagine both. I know it's hard to be both, but to at least imagine and stay open to both. And just two last questions. And the last one comes from the friend who actually introduced me to your work, uh, Laurent uh, Quazy, the writer. And he wanted to know, and I, and since he asked, I do too, uh, your thoughts on alchemy and the history of that in science. And if that's something you've looked at in your looks at anomalous experiences. Yeah, so alchemy is something I have not really written about because I don't know much about it. What I will say about it, though, that that I think is significant is that I think a lot of modern physics is essentially alchemical. You know, it's about trying to achieve some kind of vision of matter that's essentially spiritual or, or energetic, as the physicists would say today. And I also think that a lot of these anomalous experiences, people talk a lot about energies and vibrations and radiation and all kinds of energy metaphors. I don't think that's the same energy that physicists are talking about, but I think it's very real. And so there still is a kind of alchem the alchemical quest for me is locating spirit and matter, essentially. And I think that's a, essentially what's happening in the modern world with these quantum mystical literatures, that it's essentially an attempt again to locate spirit in the heart of matter. Um, but I don't know enough about the medieval alchemical traditions. Um, other than when I read about them, they totally confuse me. You know, they're just so, so complex. Um, and I've read a lot of Jung. You know, Jung was, of course, obsessed with these alchemical traditions, but I have a very hard time following him, partly because he was a horrible writer, um, partly because what he's writing about is really complicated. Actually, that, there I want to slip in that one last, that one personal question I was curious about. Your writing is so clear and and well done and tight. And I was wondering, does it mostly just kind of flow here and it comes down like that? Or am I looking at a ton of drafts to get what I'm reading? Yeah. Yeah. Um, first of all, you're looking at a ton of drafts. Uh, the lap, the laptop. Good, that makes me feel better. Us, so thank you. Yeah, the laptop has allowed us to rewrite things almost infinitely. I, I probably rewrite. I probably write over a document twenty or thirty times before I'm done with it. So you're you're seeing of something that's very polished. Um, but you're also seeing an intention. I mean, I I did shift. If you read the early work, it's harder to read. It's more technical. The later work, I hope it's more accessible, but that's a conscious choice on my part. Part of it was actually reading Charles Fort. I don't know if you've ever read Charles Fort. Uh, not yet, Have but I'm Charles planning Fort? to after reading your stuff. Oh my God. I mean, he's just, he's, he's basically the, what I call the Mark Twain of the paranormal. I mean, he, he's hilarious, but he wears his heart and his mind on his sleeve and he's, he just, he just writes things that don't even make grammatical sense, but you know exactly what he's trying to say. And when I, someone, someone read my stuff and said, geez, you sound a lot like Charles Ford. And I was like, who the hell is Charles Ford? I never heard of this guy. And so I went and I read Charles Ford and I was like, oh my God, this is my hero. You know, this, this guy is, first of all, a lot of the things he said is just wrong. I mean, he was completely wrong about all kinds of things, but he just had this way of, of writing that I just find so engaging. And, and I, and I love writing and I, I, I feel like when I write, I'm alive, you know, I get, and I get depressed. I, I literally get depressed when I go for long stretches without writing because it's, it's like, you know, a runner needs to run and a farmer needs to farm and, you know, I need to write. I hear that. And for anyone who wouldn't read his writing, I would definitely recommend The Secret Body uh, if you want to jump into the first book. It's a really beautiful look at, I think a lot of your thinking in, in one place was kind of the idea. And you start it by talking about your own mythic story about how you yourself are a myth 
and you're here to do something that that and we're all here to do something that's great and it really inspired me personally just to read that intro let alone the rest of the work and so my last question would be what do you recommend to us listeners who want to connect with the mythic inside ourselves yeah so yeah that's a big question but so I, I, would, I would say ask yourself, first of all, we're all being lived by myth. There, there, there's a story that's living us. And by that, I mean we're all born into a culture. Some of us are born into a religion, sometimes not. But even if you're born into a secular culture, you're being lived by a story that your ancestors wrote. And the, the power of the humanities is making you aware of that getting you to step out of that story and to ask yourself, do I really want to live in that story still? Is, is that a good story? Or do I want to help tell a different story that I may never get to live in, but our descendants will? And so you, you, you enter this kind of in, intergenerational process about questioning what story one was born into and whether we might want our children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren to live in a different story and how you can work toward that different story. And there's all kinds of things that I think are really quite wrong about the stories we're living in. And I think lots of people are trying to change them right now. Um, millions of people are trying to change the story we're living in. And and I think that's kind of the process, or that's the project. So a myth isn't something, I don't, I'm not talking about myth as something false or untrue. I'm talking about a myth that's so deep and so unconscious that we assume it to be the case, but it's really just a story um, that can be changed. And that's what we're here to do. Yeah. Well, great. Thank you so much, Dr. Kripal, for taking the time to share today. I really appreciated it. Yeah, no, it was fun. And you've obviously come to this with a lot of reading and a lot of thinking. I appreciate that. Um, yes, there'll be a, uh, links in the episode notes to a whole bunch of Dr. Kripal's work, uh, as well as some online videos and things like that. And uh, so again, thank you so much for taking the time to share with us today. Sure. If you'd like to dive into Dr. Kripal's work, the shortest and easiest book is his most recent, called The Flip. It's about how so many great thinkers have been flipped by a strange experience in their life, often a result of a disease, a near-death experience, or something else unexpected that changed their worldview forever. For a thicker, meatier book that goes over all of the things that he's put into his books, the one to read is Secret Body, Erotic and Esoteric Currents in the History of Religions. This one is particularly poetic and a great overview of the many directions that you could go from there. For learning more about paranormal experiences, which I'm starting to believe is the literature that every humanist scientist should engage in at least a little. Read Authors of the Impossible, Paranormal of the Sacred. It lays out the many fields where diligent researchers have verified the experiences that are outside the explanation of our current materialistic thinking, with time flowing in one direction and all of us being separated beings. It's a deeply spiritual book about how these events might have shaped world history and give us a clue to the world we'd like to create for the future. Mutants and Mystics is the book that I read half of years ago while working at Bruce Damer's house in the archives of Timothy Leary. I never could get this book out of my head and I always meant to go back and try to find it. It's about how the comic books and graphic novels of the US in the last century became the repository for mystical and magical thinking that had been forced underground. And that is where some of the most uniquely American myths arose. His first book is called Kali's Child, and it looks at homoeroticism and the teachings of the Hindu saint Ramakrishna, which was what got him blacklisted and hounded by Hindu fundamentalists for years. Then he followed that thinking into the rest of the religions in his book Roads of Excess, Palaces of Wisdom, as well as The Serpent's Gift, which looks more widely at Gnosticism. His book on Esalen is a great history of that fabled institution, and has been praised by my friends who lived through those heydays. It looks at the American story of the religion of no religion. Dr. Kripal also has many lectures that you can find online, because while I tried to get in as many questions in here as I could, with a thinker like this, there's always more to dive into. 
Thanks for tuning in. To listen to other episodes, check out pluscbdoil.com, listen on all the podcast platforms, or see us on YouTube. Subscribe to the CV Sciences YouTube channel to see each new episode. And if you'd like to buy any of our fine products, use the coupon code LEXFILES for 25% off. If you have any questions, compliments, or suggestions, feel free to write me at research at cvsciences.com. And please follow the podcast on Twitter at The Lex Files Show, where I try to keep it fun. If you enjoyed this program, please give us a like on your favorite platform or share a link to your social media. It means a lot to us. The Lex Files is produced by Matt Payne. The YouTube videos are by Brendan Cleek. Thank you to Tina Molnar and Jasmine Morris for the visuals. And the music is by Jake Bradford Sharp. Our sponsor is CV Sciences, makers of America's favorite CBD oil. And I'm Lex Pelger, signing off.